the singular correspondence which may be traced between the passage chambers of the Grand Pyramid, called by the Egyptians of old the Kut, or Lights, and the various stages traversed, according to the creed of that ancient nation, by the holy dead in passing from the light of earth to the light of eternal day, was first pointed out by me last year in the pages of the New Review. Previously to publication the article was submitted in substance to M. Maspero and Professor Says, and I desire to express my sincere thanks to those eminent authorities for the recognition and encouragement which they afforded me, as well as to Mr. Menjdot, the hieroglyphic scholar, for his revision of my work. In the present book the same analogy is worked out in much fuller detail, not completely indeed, for that may well need the labor of years, but sufficiently, I would hope, to present a clear basis for further investigation in either direction. In the case of the ritual, we obtain what appears to me to be a consistent and intelligible analysis of that hitherto impenetrable creed, through the gradual transformation of the faculties in successive stages of illumination. With regard to the pyramid, we are led to suggest a spiritual and most far-sighted purpose for its construction. For in that marvelous edifice, the very stones of which in their silent harmony seem to rebuke the idle charges of folly and pride heaped by ignorance upon the architect, we have nothing less than an indestructible and immutable symbol of the national religion. The value of the general theory here proposed depends therefore, it is evident, upon the accuracy of the correspondence established, or sought to be established, between the path so jealously concealed within the interior of the Pyramid of Light and the path described textually in the well-known collection of sacred Egyptian writings, which is called by us the Book of the Dead, but which claims for its own title the Book of the Master of the Hidden Places. But those points of correspondence are so numerous in themselves, and form so severe, a system of checks upon each other, as to reduce almost to nothing the chance of their arising from mere coincidence, while no amount of ingenuity, the deadliest perhaps of all opponents to truth, could suffice to satisfy the innumerable conditions connected with the worship, the calendar, and the civil constitution of the country which such a correspondence must fulfill. Close to the verge of the immense desert which stretches its arid wastes across the whole breadth of the continent to the shore of the western ocean, just at the apex of the famous delta which marks the meeting point of Upper and Lower Egypt, at the very spot where the busy life of the earliest civilization on record was bordered by the vast and barren solitude, stands the most majestic and most mysterious monument ever erected by the hand of man. Of all the other structures which made the marvels of the ancient world, scarcely a vestige is left. Where are the hanging gardens, the boast of the monarch of Babylon? Where are the far-famed pharos of Alexandria? Centuries have passed since earthquake laid low the Colossus which bestrode the harbor of Rhodes, and a madman's hand reduced to ashes the temple of Artemis, the pride of Ephesus. But the Grand Pyramid of Giza still remains undestroyed and indisruptible, ages after the lesser marvels have passed away, as it stood ages before ever they came into being. Certainly more than 50, it may be more than 60, centuries have gone by since that building, which never since has needed the care of man, first concealed from view its hidden places, those secret chambers of which no other building on the globe contains the like. Upwards of two million times has the sun risen and set upon its mighty walls, since first the pure and unbroken surface of polished casing stones flashed back the rays like a veil of dazzling luster, and vindicated its ancient title of the light. What the concealed significance may be of that secret masonry, by whom, and for what purpose, the complex plan was designed, at what epoch the huge structure was erected, are questions which have perplexed many minds in many lands, and have resulted in a discord more akin to Babel, than to the grandeur of its silent majesty. It was built by the Jews in the days of their captivity, says, or rather said, one school of theorists. It was built by Chemis, but attributed by Egyptians in hatred of him to the shepherd Felician, 
is the account given by Herodotus. It was built by Ibn Salluk, say the Arabs, just before the flood, to preserve the royal treasures from the predicted inundation. It was built by Melchizedek, or somebody, vehemently asserts the Scottish professor of astronomy, who seems always to write in a whirlwind of miscellaneous indignation. It was indisputably intended by the founder for his tomb, one party stoutly maintains, a tomb in which he left special instructions that he should not be buried, and in which nobody could possibly have been buried, replies another. It was an observatory, maintains a third, where every place for observation was carefully closed up, retorts a fourth. It is the prophetic floral of human history, screams Professor Smith, with all the dates gone wrong, softly sneers at Mr. Flinders Petrie. Side by side with that Masonic mystery, while nigh as impenetrable at the present moment as when the Hersheshta, or Master of the Secret, was an officer of Pharaoh's household, has come down to us another enigma, the strange collections of sacred writings, or ritual of ancient Egypt, which modern writers have called the Book of the Dead, but which claims for itself the title of the Book of the Master of the Hidden Places. Vivid as is the interest now awakened in those writings, little progress has been made in elucidating their meaning. The doctrines inculcated by their religion, the relations of the worshipper to the object or objects worshipped, the signification of the particular symbol under which those relations were at once veiled and expressed, are but little better understood at the present time, notwithstanding our greatly increased knowledge of the sacred writings, than when the hieroglyphs themselves were undeciphered. Yet, strange to say, prominently as these mysteries stand out in every matter that relates to ancient Egypt, no one has hitherto thought of collating the Masonic secret of the monument with the doctrinal secret contained in the mysterious books of Thoth, to whom the origin of Egyptian wisdom is. Not wanting on either side to hint at the connection. That Khufu, miscalled by the Greeks, Cheops, should have adopted the pyramidal form in the hieroglyph of his name is not surprising, as he was the monarch under whom the building was erected. But it is not perhaps unworthy of notice, that the form of the pyramid enters into the hieroglyph of the star Sotis, or for the Grand Orient, or position of that star when its rising forms the immediate harbinger of dawn on midsummer morning, was, as is well known, the great starting point for the age-long cycles of the Egyptian reckoning. And whereas the figure usually employed to denote the pyramid embraces both the edifice and the rocky platform on which it is built, the form used in the hieroglyph of Sotis consists of the Masonic portion alone, that is to say, the structure which represented to the Egyptian mind the eternal light, apart from its earthly support, while a papyrus dating from the time of Khufu, the founder of the building, speaks of Isis as the ruler of the pyramid, and a later inscription, that of Sin, calls her also the mother of God, and identifies her with the divine Sotis, the star, the queen of the heaven. On the other hand, the sacred writings, or ritual of ancient Egypt, are full of illusions which become vocal only when applied to the pyramid of light. Such are the festivals of the Northern Passage and of the Southern Passage, that of the Hidden Lintel, that of Osiris, who dwells in the roofed house and in the pool of the great house. So in the calendar of Esne, we read of the festival of the sockets, and again of the opening of the doors, which is closely connected in the ritual with the chapter of the orientation and the raising of Osiris from the open tomb. The whole progress of the departed seems, in fact, to take place in some kind of building. The ritual is full of references to his going in and coming out, to going in after coming out, to passing gates and gateways, and doors and staircases. Nay, the very titles employed, whether in the written or the Masonic record, point directly, though secretly, to each other. Then we shall have marked out the four cardinal points of the universal sphere, the four points whereby the sides of the pyramid of light were defined, the fiery seats, 
according to the Egyptian theosophy, of the four sons of light, whereof the most famous was Happy, the presiding spirit of the Nile. Into that grand horizon too, when the equal day is done, the sun passes beneath the western waters. And out of it, the whole host of stars, from pole to pole, in serried array, each preserving his appointed distance from the solar path, follow him through the silent night, the night of reckoning the spirits, one half springing into light as their leader disappears, the rest completing their numbers, just in time to herald his return from the eastern point of the same grand horizon. The road is of fire, says the ritual, they whirl in fire behind him. Now this horizon seems strikingly indicated by the entrance passage of the Grand Pyramid, which, as is well known, may be defined by reference to the position of the pole star. For, taking as the date of the IVTH dynasty that given by Dr. Bruch, about BC 3700, we find that about 200. And 60 years later, BC 3440, the pole star of the period, Alpha Draconis, occupied, as Professor Smith has pointed out, just that position, so that it would shine right down the passage. And thus the disciples of the Master of the Secret, who in successive generations must have watched for more than two centuries the approach of the star, would receive in its final coordination the most convincing proof of the truth of those astronomical relations, wherein their mystical religion was embodied. Hence when we read in the ritual, of the, good paddle of the north the opener of the disc, we recall at once the narrow paddle-shaped passage widened at the entrance towards the north, which opens the sacred interior to the outer universe, the pointer of the dial which sweeps through space, indicating perennially the position occupied by each successive star, which for a brief period of centuries keeps watch before the pole. Taking in our hands now, the sacred writings of the Per Emhru, let us approach the Masonic light, and opening the book at the first chapter, where Thoth the eternal wisdom commences to instruct the catechumen freed from the corruption of the body, let us with him penetrate the interior of the building, and take such a preliminary view of its secret places and their analogues in the ritual, as may enable us to study more deeply the twofold expression of that Masonic mystery. Reciting chapter by chapter as we mount, grade by grade along with the catechumen of light, we approach at the fifteenth step a gateway two courses yet above us, just as the catechumen in the fifteenth chapter approaches the double gate of the horizon, the double arched gate which points towards the pole star, when he invokes Haroeris the great guide of the world, the guide of the souls in their secret places, the light dwelling in the horizon. From this point the first veil of secrecy begins. For so effectually was the opening concealed from the uninstructed eyes by a revolving stone, that the position, once lost, was impossible to recover, and for two hundred years after passing under the barbarous Omar, the building remained impenetrable, until Caliph al-Mamun, in the ninth century of our era, forced an opening at random through the solid masonry, and hit accidentally upon the entrance passage. Entering by the low gateway, thus built in the northern side, at a considerable height above the ground, we have before us the passage of the horizon of the point of equinox, which, while descending southwards into the depths of darkness, points northwards towards the star of the purple arch. As we cross the gate on the seventeenth course, we recognize the point where, in the seventeenth chapter, the catechumen is admitted as a postulant and exclaims, I go from the gate of Taser, the ascent. What is the gate of Taser? It is the gate where the god Shu, the light, lifts the disk of heaven. The gate of the north is the gate of the great god, he continues, speaking evidently of the same gate, exactly as in the pyramid the only entrance is the gate of the ascent in the seventeenth course of northern face. Bidding now with him farewell to the light of earthly day, and treading the descending passage, we pass, some little way down, a very fine and beautifully ruled double line, seven scored perpendicularly on the slanting wall so as to point downwards to the foundation, 
and separating the upper section of the passage where the departed in the ritual is bereft of every faculty except that of motion, from the more advanced portion where his mental faculties are gradually restored to him. Continuing the long descent, we arrive at an aperture in the western wall, and passing through the opening thus disclosed mount gently into a kind of grotto at the bottom of the well, a square perpendicular shaft, with footholds cut in the precipitous sides. Into that chamber of the deep waters the postulant descends on the western side, as the sun at the close of day goes down into the western waters, and bursts forth in splendor on the hidden world. From the top of the shaft a level passage runs to the place of the divine birth mentioned in the ritual, the chamber of the moon, where, according to Egyptian teaching, Osiris each month renewed his birth. In that chamber, once rigidly blocked up, the liberated soul was born anew, and thence it came forth to descend the ladder of the shaft, as we see in the papyrus of Ani, and to become reunited with the postulant awaiting it in the well of life. Then, when the soul is restored, initiation takes place and strength is given to endure the ordeal. Returning from the bottom of the well to the passage of the horizon, and pursuing our course still further downwards, we come, after a short level continuation, to the subterranean chamber or the place of the central fire, where the initiate undergoes his ordeal a chamber hewn out of the solid rock, and having an inaccessible floor covered with huge blocks of varying height resembling a pool of petrified flame, or the masses of the mountain chains formed by the action of the earths. Central fire, while beyond that terrible chamber a small passage leads to nothingness. Resuming our exploration of the edifice, and coming forth from the place of ordeal, as the initiate, now become the adept, turns back and avoids the place of annihilation, we remount the passage of the horizon until, at a little distance below the scored line, we come to a granite gate, or portcullis, built in the roof. This great gate, which originally was totally hidden by masonry and was only discovered by the falling of a stone when Almamun was forcing his entrance into the pyramid, stands at the threshold of the secret places. Not only was the whole gate carefully hidden, but the lower portion of the passage within was blocked with enormous stones, still unremoved, and perhaps irremovable. So even now the lintel is still hidden, and admission is only effected through a hole forced by violence in the wall of the passage above the blocks, while a precisely similar difficulty is experienced by the adept in passing the lintel of justice before entering the double hall of truth. Creeping with difficulty through the hole, we find ourselves in a small low corridor about 129 feet long, inclined upwards at an elevation slightly less than that of the depression of the entrance passage and corresponding to the lower portion of the Hall of Truth where the adept justifies himself before the 42 judges of the unseen world, the gods of the horizon, and the gods of the orbit. Then, stooping beneath the low gateway, by which it is terminated, but not obstructed, at the top, the gateway of the festival, we stand upon a kind of landing place, from which the whole system of the interior passages opens out. On every side, is, the crossing of the pure roads of life, of which the coffin of Amamu speaks. On the western side, is the mouth of the well, the gate of Anruf leading down to the, roads of darkness. Before us lie the fields of Alu, the blessed country where the justified executes the works which he is privileged to perform for Osiris. I have digged in Anruf, he says later on, I have drilled the holes, the holes, that is, for the good seed, the corn which grew seven cubits high, the holes which are drilled in the ramps of the southern ascending passage, but to which no signification has yet been attached. Beyond the fields, the road leads direct to the Queen's Chamber, the place of the new birth, where the soul received her second life, and here on the eastern wall, within a staircase of five ascents, is a kind of niche or image, the type, to use the expression of the ritual, into which the soul is newborn with the fivefold dominion of the regenerate senses. From the same point also, 
at the head of the well, diverge the interior ladders on the coffin already spoken of. Sheer down, the ladder which has been made for Osiris, descends into the well. Northwards, the ladder of earth, slopes downward to the hidden lintel, the entrance of the upward path. Upwards to the south, but with a very slightly different inclination, runs the ascending passage, called by some writers, the Grand Gallery, forming the upper portion of the Hall of Truth, the Grand Lodge, or luminous chamber of the orbit. This remarkable structure, consists of a corridor, about 157 feet long, and 20 feet high, built entirely on a slope, floor, walls, and roof, except a small portion at the southern or upper end. On either side of the sloping floor, are 28 ramps, each with a hole in it, a reference to which in the ritual has been already noticed. And at the upper end the slope of the floor line is closed abruptly, just above the queen's chamber by a block three feet high, forming a dais, or throne of judgment. From hence along the top of the block, or seat of the throne, the passage runs level for about 61 inches, the wall at the side being not quite vertical, but impending very slightly towards the slope. At the back of the throne the gallery is brought to a termination, by the southern wall closing down in seven overlapping within 42 inches of the seat and leaving as an exit further south, a narrow and grave-like tunnel. In the sloping roof of the gallery, running downwards from south to north at a somewhat greater inclination than the floor, are 36 overlappings, like the waves of a river of light and corresponding to the number of decades in the orbit of the Egyptian year. And on the side wall of the dais at the upper end of the gallery are also seven overlappings, one above another, arching over to the summit, while in the position corresponding to that occupied by our own globe among the planets, runs a deep groove or orbit along its entire length. Thus we are confronted with a vivid connection between the orbit and the passage of the sun, in the double hall of truth, the lower hall of truth in darkness, and the upper hall of truth in splendor, with the throne of radiance at the higher end. And above that throne rises the habitation of the seven great spirits in the service of their Lord, the Creator, who, the sacred books tell us, protect the coffin of Osiris. Now comes the most mysterious portion of the building. Stripped of its noble proportions, and reduced to an altitude so low, that a man must creep on hand and knee to pass, the passage pierces the southern wall of the Grand Gallery, and runs straight on, first into the antechamber, or place of preparation, and then into the splendid hall called the King's Chamber, in the most secluded portion of the building. In each of these halls is one and only one object. In the antechamber is a kind of Masonic veil, which no one can pass without bowing the head. In the king's chamber is a sarcophagus, not closed, but open, while the air channels wherewith this deeply buried room is amply ventilated proclaim that it is not a chamber of the dead, but of the living, the place of the Orient, where, in the ritual, Osiris is awakened from his slumbers. In this portion of the building the structure changes its material for granite, forming, as it were, a house by itself within the pyramid, an inner house yet within the house of Osiris, entered by the low and grave-like passage leading from behind the throne. This is the house of glory described on the coffin of Amamu already quoted, the house to which the illuminate approaches after passing the tribunal of Osiris. Here is the gate of the pure spirits, which they alone can enter who are washed in the waters of life and radiant with the splendors of the orbit. And here, too, it would seem, takes place the solemn address described in the Scion Sinsin, of the gods in the house of Osiris, followed by the response of the gods in the house of glory, the joyous song of the holy departed who stand victorious before the judgment seat, echoed triumphantly by the inner chorus of their beloved who have gone before them into the fullness of light. Above is the Empyrean Gate, the opening of Atha, as the ritual calls it, which leads to the secret places of heaven, the ascending spaces above the king's chamber, 
once completely closed, and constituting the innermost, the loftiest, and the most secret of the hidden places. And the whole is dominated and crowned by a gigantic triangle of granite, masonically expressing the divine trinity of Egypt. Such is the complex and hitherto unexplained system of gateways and passages, shafts, channels, and chambers, some leading upwards, some downwards, some level, some rough in the last degree, others exquisitely polished, some magnificent in their proportions, some so low that a man must creep, so narrow that he can with difficulty pass, to be found within the pyramid of light. It is absolutely unique, no other building, it may be safely averred, not even the later pyramids, having contained any structure bearing the least resemblance to the higher chambers. Striking as it is in every feature, the most remarkable circumstance of all is the evident intention of the architect to preserve that secrecy which lends a majesty to the strange theosophy of Egypt. What then was the design, the secret and jealously guarded design, with which this wondrous edifice was constructed? That its various features are meaningless, or the mere result of caprice, is a suggestion to which the forethought and lavishness of calculation displayed in every detail unmistakably give the lie. Nor again can we maintain that they are necessary for the purposes of an ordinary tomb. For, in the first place, they are not to be found in the other pyramids, which were used for that purpose, and, secondly, if there be any intention which the architect has openly manifested, it is to create such a series of obstructions, that no human body could be buried therein. In truth, the Grand Pyramid is the house of a tomb, but it is not a closed, but an open tomb. It is the tomb not of a man, but a god, not of the dead, but of the risen. It is the tomb of the divine Osiris, whose birth on earth, descent into the underworld, victory over the serpent Apep, resurrection, and judgment of the dead, were the most prominent features in the creed of Egypt, and in union with whom the holy departed achieved the path of illumination, and passed in safety the divine tribunal. Viewed in this light, the practical value of the structure begins to become clear. On that doctrine rested the whole organization of social life amongst the ancient Egyptians. The calendar, the festivals, the duties of the monarch, the rites of the priesthood, the relations of the provinces to their paramount temples, all were illustrated in the path of light. Endless confusion therefore in the state would result, no less than injury to the religion, from any misconstruction, or misrepresentation of doctrine such as seems to have taken place under Ku En Aten, a circumstance all the more likely to occur, on account of the obscurity of the symbols employed. Now the Masonic symbolism of the Grand Pyramid affords a simple and practically indestructible means for perpetuating without betraying the doctrine of Egyptian wisdom. That expression, once formulated, was never repeated, the other tombs and pyramids of Egypt claiming kinship only by subordinate and particular features with the work of the Grand Master. While then the written records of the ritual, none of which now extant probably possess a higher date than that of Khufu, were liable to change and error, no lapse of time could impair, no variation could affect in the secret places, the masonry of the Pyramid of Light. This embodiment, at once secret and unalterable, forming literally a Masonic ritual of the whole doctrine of light, accounts for the singularly piecemeal fashion in which the sacred words were committed to writing. During the first three dynasties one chapter alone has a dim traditional claim to have been written, while one other is said to have been revealed to Men Ra, the grandson of the builder of the Grand Pyramid. And though on the later pyramids sacred inscriptions begin to appear, it is not until the Exith dynasty that they become at all common. Of the various chapters so published, that is, used as inscriptions or written on papyri, at different times, there have been, as Mr. Budge mentions in his, Treatise on the Mummy, for principal recensions. The first is that of the ancient empire, written in hieroglyphics, 
to which the important inscription on the coffin of Amamu belongs. Then comes the Thaban recension, also in hieroglyphics, of which the papyri have been with great labor collated and published by M. Naville, followed during the succeeding dynasty, XXTH, by another written in the hieratic, or priestly, characters. And last of all, we have the recension of the XXV or Saita dynasty, to which is due the great papyrus now preserved at Turin, of which Lepsius published a facsimile in 1846, consisting of upwards of 160 original, with three supplementary chapters. Now it was during that recension that the order of the chapters is said to have been fixed for the first time. What canon then, or standard of order, did the revisers employ? It certainly was not the relative antiquity of the chapters, for the only one which claims to remount to the East dynasty stands 130th in the papyrus, while that which is attributed in it to the 4th dynasty, and which is entitled, The Entrance on Light in one chapter, as though it had once been the single chapter in use, comes 64th. But the answer to the question appears to be contained in the last of the supplementary chapters, for the papyrus proclaims the key to be within the reach of all who understand in full the Masonic secrets. This book, it says, is the book of the master of the hidden places. And in those hidden places therefore the secret of the master of the hidden places, the mystery of the words of order, as the coffin of Amamu says, is to be found. This is the version, therefore, which we shall compare with the ritual in stone, its predecessor by more than 3,000 years, the very magnitude of the intervening period serving to exhibit in a more striking light the closeness of the correspondence. Nobly indeed does that stupendous monument respond to the mystic title which it bore. Surrounded by darkness as profound as that which the Almighty has made his secret place, in the midst of scenery invisible to the eye, but faithfully portraying the glories of the celestial expanse, the grand architect has set up the throne which the lapse of ages has had no power to impair, and has immutably inscribed in its secret places the immutable path of the just in characters of light, embodied in the immutable motions of the heavenly orbs.